The construction of the Milan castle dates back to 1360, when Galeazzo II Visconti, Lord of Milan, and his brother Pernabò decided to build a fortress near to the city walls, close to Porta Giovia, one of the city gates. At that time, Galeazzo II still resided in Pavia, and the Milanese fortress was meant for military purposes only. When he died in 1378, the castle of Porta Giovia passed to his son, Gian Galeazzo, who, after getting rid of his uncle Bernabò, became the first Duke of Milan. He ordered the construction of a citadel next to the castle, but outside of the city walls. He would reside there in a new building, protected by soldiers in the area where the Rocchetta today stands. Since the new building had large windows not suited to a fortress, additional walls were erected around it and surrounded by a moat. These new fortifications were called the Garland and form an extension of the city walls. With the construction of the Garland, the area of the current ducal courtyard began to host troops and in the following years the fortification was completed with the construction of the new ducal apartment. Gian Galeazzo died in 1402 and was succeeded by his son Giovanni Maria, a 14 years old boy under the ward of his mother Caterina. In 1404, during clashes with a faction linked to the heirs of Bernabò, the citadel was partially destroyed. To Giovanni Maria, assassinated in 1412, succeeded his brother Filippo Maria, who demolished the portion of the old city walls that divided the citadel from the castle. The part of the city moat that still separated the two complexes was kept dry. The castle was connected to the city by two ravelins, that of Santo Spirito and that of Santa Maria del Carmine. Probably the gateway to the ducal courtyard was surmounted by a tower, as shown in this city map by Pietro del Massai. The garland, with its angular towers, was connected to the castle by a covered walkway, which still exists. The ruins of the two round towers, that of Victory and that of the Calverin, and those of the gate to the park, the gate of the rescue, are still visible today half covered by vegetation. Signs of the separation of the citadel from the old castle can be seen by observing the moat's escarpment in Cerizo stone, which, at the corners of the Rocchetta and of the ducal courtyard, ends and turns in walls. Apart from the first stretch, later reinforced with a brick wall, the Cerizo escarpment reappears near the tower of Bona of Savoy and at the end of the moat. A careful analysis of the slots in which the beams of the scaffolding for the construction were placed allows to detect a discontinuity between the two walls built in different periods. The death of Filippo Maria Visconti in 1447, a power void, led to the creation of the Ambrosian Republic, during which the castle was demolished. Only the lowest parts of the complex survived, the foundation of the Rocchetta, of the Ducal Courtier, of the drawbridge landings, of the Revelins, and the covered walkway. They probably survived only because they were covered by rubbles. In 1450, Francesco Sforza was acclaimed by the people as the new Duke of Milan. He knew that the Milanese had vetoed rebuilding the fortress. Nevertheless, he soon started its reconstruction by raising the ground level by four and a half meters. We can see this by observing how this window, dating back to the age of the Visconti, was walled up in order to allow the flooding of the moat. Between 1451 and 52, the construction of the side facing the city began. It was a building of over 13 meters width, with a wall three and a half meters thick that should have reached a height of 15 meters. Francesco Sforza tried to conceal his intentions by letting the Milan people believe that he would open large windows in the wall facing the city, which he eventually did. In 1455, the construction of two projecting round towers began. Their bases had the form of truncated cones. 
The cylindrical towers were cladded by diamond-shaped stones that could withstand artillery fire. Their walls were nearly seven meters thick. They housed six cup-shaped rooms illuminated by deep embrasures. Later on, during the Spanish domination, the crenellation on the top of the towers will be eliminated in order to ease the deployment of cannon. In 1451, the Duke invited to Milan Antonio Averulino, better known as the Filarete, to whom he commissioned the design of a great tower on the gateway towards the city. The walls of the garland were prolonged until they reached the two round towers, while the lateral gateways of Santo Spirito and of the Carmine lost their function of connecting the castle to the city. Probably for this reason, the connection between the passageway of the age of the Visconti and the new walls were not completed. Francesco Sforza died in 1457 and was succeeded by Galeazzo Maria, who entrusted the Florentine architect Benedetto Ferrini with the design of his new residence in the castle. In the ducal courtyard, a large staircase was built, which could be climbed on horseback. It led to a portico with a loggia, which gave access to the great hall and to the rooms of the residence. At the bottom of the courtyard was the portico of the elephant, so named after a fresco on its wall. In 1472, on the ground floor, the ducal chapel was completed, with its richly decorated interior. In 1476, Galeazzo Maria was killed by conspirators in front of the church of Santo Stefano. His widow, Bona of Savoy, decided to reinforce the Rocchetta in order to protect her son, Gian Galeazzo, with the help of her powerful counselor, Cicco Simonetta. The core of the fortification was the Torre Castellana, also called Treasure Tower. At its base, two portico buildings form a right angle. This tower had a rectangular plan, with a longer side measuring over 20 meters and protruding from the outer walls of the castle by about 3 meters. It consisted of two large upper rooms and of a basement. Another building was erected in the courtyard against the wall, in which a doorway gave access to the Piazza d'Armi, the parade ground. At the corner of this building, a 43 meters tower was erected in order to gain better control of such access. In 1480, with the execution of Cicco Simonetta and the exile of Bona to the town of Abbiate, Ludovico il Moro, another son of Francesco Sforza, assumed the role of governor of the duchy and of guardian of the young Gian Galeazzo, his nephew. A lover of literature and art, the Moro invited to Milan great artists, such as Leonardo da Vinci, who decorated the Sala delle Asse, that is the hall of the wooden boards in the Falconry Tower, and Bramantino, who painted Argos on a wall of the treasure room in the castle tower. Several drawings of the castle by Leonardo da Vinci exist. The most fascinating one is a study of a huge lighthouse tower that should have replaced the Tower of Filarete. Also interesting is the plan of a large square in front of the castle, a gigantic equestrian monument of Francesco Sforza should have been placed in its centre, but Leonardo will never manage to realise this statue. Ludovico also ordered the construction of the so-called Ponticella, attributed by many to Donato Bramante, also active in the Milan castle. It was a building erected on the brick bridge on the outer moat, connecting the ducal courtyard with the garland. It consisted of three rooms along the port. In the same period, Bernardino da Corte was planning the completion of the Rocchetta towards the ducal courtyard, in which a portico building was erected. In 1494, with the death of his nephew Gian Galeazzo, 
possibly due to poisoning, Ludovico il Moro became officially the Duke of Milan. As Niccolò Machiavelli had noted, fortresses don't give you any advantage, because they are either lost by the betrayal of those in charge of them, or by the violence of the assailants, or by hunger. This proved true also for the Milan castle, which in 1499, after Ludovico had fled the city, was handed over to the French of Louis XII by the treason of Bernardino da Corte. Ludovico will manage to return five months later, but was finally defeated on April 4, 1500 by the French army under the command of Gian Giacomo Trivulzi. In 1521, lightning struck the tower of Filarete and provoked in the armory inside it an explosion that completely destroyed the tower and part of the castle. In 1529, a member of the Sforza dynasty, Francesco II, was reinstated as Duke of Milan with the support of Emperor Charles V. Upon his death, in 1535, the Duchy of Milan was annexed to the Empire. In the following years, under the rule of Ferrante Gonzaga, the city walls were enlarged, straight ramparts were built with bricks and serizzo, and connected by huge bastions. In this plan of 1594, we can observe how the connection between the new walls and the castle was ensured by a special rampart surrounded by a moat called the prison. On the other side of the castle, in the direction of Porta Comasina, architect Cesare Cesariano designed a longer rampart, having the form of pincers. In fact, one of the entry gates to Milan will be named after the Italian word for pincers, Tenaglia. Already since 1559, the Spanish governors had been aware of the need to surround the castle with bastions in accordance with modern fortification techniques, which had been transformed by the development of artillery. In 1568, the bastions Padilla, San Iago and Albuquerque had already been completed on the side facing the city. After the demolition of the fortifications of the prison and of the pincers, the last three bastions were built, so that by the end of the century the fortification works were completed. The last three bastions were named after former fortress commanders, Don Pedro, Velasco and Acuna. When one approached the castle from outside, before the moat, he found uphill terraces, which made enemy artillery fire less effective. Between these terraces and the moat, there was a sheltered road and a counter escarpment. On the other side of the moat, there was the escarpment and, on the top of it, a walkway that separated it from the outer wall. On the top of this wall, a tilted parapet sheltered the walk of the sentinels. For the construction of only one of those bastions, no less than nine million bricks were needed. At the two sides of each bastion, two recesses hosted artillery bunkers, allowing protection from close-range assaults. But how did the castle look like in the age of the Spanish domination? The army barracks were positioned against the walls of the Piazza d'Armi and of the Garland, while the military commander of the castle occupied the upper floors of the ducal courtyard. The map shows the numerous wells and the latrines. The kitchens were in the Piazza d'Armi and the butchery was placed over the outer moat. The mills for the flour and for the gunpowder were near the reveling of Santo Spirito. The hospital faced the Piazza d'Armi. The stables were next to the great staircase. A foundry in the garland produced ammunition, an ammunition depot were in the Rocchetta, and, somewhat surprisingly, also in the ducal courtyard, in the great hall 
through which modern visitors gain access to the city museums. The still existing rusticated doorway dates back to 1607, when this room was converted into a hall for banquets and parties. The reveling towards the city was built by the French after the destruction of the Filarete Tower. The French also built another protruding fortification on the opposite side, in front of the gateway of the rescue, a fortification that was later demolished to build the bastions, still in construction at the time of this drawing. Between the bastions Padilla and Don Pedro, and between the bastions Albuquerque and Acuna, two other fortifications are shown, called Cavalieri Knights. They were possibly never built. In the rocchetta intended to store food and ammunition, the eastern porch had been partly walled up in order to create space for housing. What is today the Hall of the Treasure had become a carpenter's workshop, named the Hall of the Rope. The staircase was then flanked by stables. A church had taken the place of the ducal chapel, a chapel with an altar occupied, along with a poultry house, the northern porch. In this fresco, located in the Arese Borromeo Palace in Cesano Maderno, we can clearly see the gateway, which gave access to the guard post. It was made of rustic stone, and a large heraldic shield was placed above the arch. You can see a large haystack beside the wall. It was the nevera used to preserve ice. After digging up a hole in the ground, its walls were plastered with sand and lime and covered with hay, so as to give it a conical shape. You can also see how the demolition of the pincer-shaped fortification had created a pond, complete with fishermen. In this beautiful painting by Bernardo Bellotto, we can admire in the foreground the Albuquerque bastions with its three sentry boxes with hip roof, the one on the tip of the bastion with a pentagonal section, the other two with an octagonal one. The castle could accommodate up to 3,000 infantry troops and 500 horses. In 1647, in accordance with the blueprints of the military engineer Francesco Prestino, six crescent-shaped fortifications were added to the bastion. With the passage of the Milan region to the House of Habsburgs of Austria, celebrations were organized in the castle, such as the one of 1649 in the occasion of the arrival of Mary Anne of Austria. In the meantime, the custom of taking carriage rides in front of the castle had been established, as documented by this painting by Sebastianone that can be seen in the Museum of Milan. In 1796, with the arrival of Napoleon's armies, the dismantling of the bastions began, starting with those facing the city. Because of the huge quantity of material to be removed, the demolition works were long and expensive. Due to the robustness of the structures, explosives had to be employed. The two round towers of the castle were lowered to the level of the walls. At the time of the celebrations for the Peace Treaty of Lunéville of April 30, 1801, the ditches facing the city had been already filled up. On that occasion, the first stone of the project of Giovanni Antolini was placed, a project of a grand circle, on which all the main public buildings of the city were to be concentrated. In its original version, the project included the demolition of the castle and the erection in the middle of the circle of a large column celebrating Napoleon. The project will never be completed, and the castle will remain for decades an area of military barracks with an adjacent area for military training. In 1803 the castle became the headquarters for the troops in Milan. 
On that year, the architect Luigi Canonica redesigned the square in front of the fortress and planned the perspective towards the park. The ancient gate of the rescue was replaced by a new central gate, that of the Barco. Also the restructuring of the part of the castle facing the city was foreseen and several projects were presented to this purpose, among which that of architect Canonica himself. After the five days of Milan, in 1849, the Austrians, who had returned to the city in order to better defend the castle, decided to cut all the trees planted around it. General Radetzky ordered to build a tower on the garland near the Revelin of Porta Vercellina. The tower communicated by means of luminous signals with the tower of the fort that had been built shortly before at Porta Vittoria. In 1864, with the unification of Italy, beside the tower of the Carmine, the riding school was built in neo-Gothic style by demolishing the last remains of the old Revelin. In the meantime, the value of the location occupied by the castle had increased, also because the opening of the new Dante Street would have connected it directly to the city centre. It was initially decided to spare from the demolition only the Rocchetta and the Ducal Court, or to replace them with a building in neo-Gothic style, as in accordance to the project of the architect Angelo Coll was architect Luca Beltrami, an extraordinary figure in the field of historical research and restoration, who started a fight for saving the castle and bringing it back to the splendor of the age of the Sforzas. Beltrami had studied in depth the history of the castle and was author of several publications about it. He convinced the city administration to undertake its restoration by eliminating all the parts that had been built after the age of the Sforzas. The riding school was demolished and also the garland, which, reconstructed under the Spanish domination, had nevertheless an ancient core. Beltrami left only few remains of it, those of the two angular towers of the Calvering and of the Victory, and those of the Gate of the Rescue. The gates of the Carmine and of Santo Spirito were reopened, which had been closed since the construction of the bastions. Their ancient look was restored in accordance with the historical research made by Beltrami. Also the tower of Bona of Savoy was refurbished by restoring its ancient granulation. In the course of the restoration of the castle's interior, Original decorations were discovered, the paintings of the Sala delle Asse, of the Hall of the Treasure and of the Ducal Chapel. The most controversial intervention was that on the castle's facade, which had become the background of the recently opened Via Dante and that appeared as a plain wall between mutilated towers. Beltrami decided to bring the two towers back to their original height and to restore their original crenellation destroyed during the Spanish domination. He carried out an in-depth iconographic research to justify his choices. He recovered many ancient images of the castle, such as this, showing St. Ambrose coming to the rescue of the Milanese in the Battle of Parabiago. Although their construction had only been outlined by Francesco Sforza, Beltrami opened six large windows in the façade, necessary to give light to the new buildings leaning against the inner side of the wall. The most complex part was the reconstruction of the Filarete Tower. In addition to all the images of it, Beltrami took the towers of the castles of Cusago and Vigevano as models, and he realized the real size silhouette of the tower, which he placed against the facade in order to evaluate its visual impact. The tower was solemnly inaugurated on September 24, 1905, 
and dedicated to King Umberto I, assassinated in Monza five years before. Beltrami plays on the gateway a high relief by Luigi Sacchi, showing the king on horseback. Inside the castle, many archives and museums are now hosted, as well as the Bibliotheque of Arts and the Applied Arts School. In the Piazza d'Armi, the ancient Spanish hospital, restored to its original appearance, hosts today the famous Pietà Rondanini by Michelangelo. The art gallery boasts many masterpieces, such as this painting of Piazza Mercanti by Bernardo Bellotti. The statue of San Giovanni Nepomuceno, the only surviving one of the three dedicated to this saint in Milan, has been standing for centuries in the same place. Against the wall opposite to the Spanish hospital, another building should have been constructed, but it was eventually decided to leave the wall and place against it the remains of ancient city mansions preserved from demolition. These belong to a Renaissance building that was behind the Cordusio in Via Bassano Porrone and to a building at the corner of Via Spadari and Via Torino, close to that Missaglia house, the staircase of which was placed by Beltrami at the entrance of the Achille Bertarelli Prince Collection. In every part of the castle you can find ancient manufacts recovered from excavations and demolished buildings. In the ducal courtyard, under the portico of the elephant, you can see the memorial stone that was placed next to the famous column, and a statue of St. John, which adorned the facade of the demolished church of San Giovanni in Conca. For many centuries, the castle had been for the Milanese an overbearing presence, a symbol of oppression. The two great towers of the age of the Sforzas and the first bastions built by the Spaniards faced the city as if the enemy had been hiding in it. Yet, the castle has become today perhaps the most beloved building in Milan, the historical and artistic memory of the city, and it is, together with the contiguous Parco del Sempione, the favorite destination for the walks of the Milanese and of the tourists.